fighting, it is because we are finally telling ourselves the crooks that we were so long prevented from saying. We are now getting control of our own world. Now we can talk about many things, about ourselves, about our worldviews, of, uh, of the Charaba teachings classified as faithless Gnostic system that were destroyed, and of our poets whose voices were forced into silence all those eons. That is why so much of the work in Dalit literature is <coughs> so personal a stem, especially in Punjabi. He is aware that it is often said that these days Dalit writings shows no stylistic distinction. Uh, last one. Uh, critics are in the habit of deriding the lack of innovation, but I think they exaggerate too much. Today's Dalit writer is as much clued into postmodern sensibilities as anyone, anywhere else, in his own words. Um, if, as for style, I would like to draw some attention to my own work. Pranayashwari, for instance, that is another novel, uh, contains passages from uh, passages that are bound to excite debate, thus giving the writing depth and perspective. In Pratham Puran, another novel, the mythic characters are in constant dialogue with others, the contemporary characters in the present, and for the Shanti Puru, I would use the computer hyperlink style so the readers sees two lines of narrative, with the one above linked to the one below, the Burdu, that can be read simultaneously. Uh, there is a last kind of paragraph, can we read it? Or the, I Okay, uh, so Kari's self statement on the process of his story making is very instructive. He shares his creative processes uh, to his audience while talking about his story, Panch Kuleda Janaja. That Panch Kuleda is the sister city of Chandigarh that opens up with him in almost a celebratory mood at the cremation of his wife's auntie. He deliberately uses Islamic expression, Janaja. That is a last rites, uh, Islamic expression to the last rites of a dead in a Brahmin family. He is happy that today he, he could wear the baggy clothes while being at his in laws. Otherwise, he would always feel restrained about and bounded by the upper caste etiquettes, uh, in his own words. I have been frightened ever since I gained my consciousness. Strange fears occupy my mind. I find I feel some shadow follows me when I walk. The heart starts pumping fervently. I feel breathlessness. While child, I used to get terrified. The fear still hangs in my head, in my heart. As grown up into adulthood, I can see everything clearly. I can feel it. But still the fear remains a mystery. Getting rid of it is difficult. I think my search of its reason, uh, search uh, of its reason is my thinking and its secret is the secret of my literature. I don't try to unravel the secrecy, I only pursue it. That's why scenes, characters, their psyche get abstracted in my stories. The picture of that secret emerges in my mind. Interesting thing is that I enjoy when I, in the process of thinking about the word, that word, my character starts talking with statues, with corpses, with donkeys. Donkeys travel with him in a bus. The whole city is full of donkeys. Character's head is of donkey. He thinks like donkey, uh, just like washerman's donkey. I don't disturb that word. I just observe it. As far as possible, I pen down the finer details. I take pleasure in painting this word. Along with my, my body gets relaxed, like I say, flower like light. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you very much. Um, yes, the, the notion of the result and the, uh, the loser of the um, It's probably very useful to, to read the novel, even though I haven't read the novel. But, okay, yeah. And um, I was going to bring in also the, uh, the counterpoint, that is, you put it at the end, you know, counterpoint and counterpoint writing that uh, Edward Said also mentions and, and 
brings in. I mean, as if it was a dialogue bringing in, intertwining yeah. uh, two voices with no single voice having precedence over the other. And so, uh, it's actually been uh, directed towards not only to Raj, it's also to Mula because it's in certain ways we have a perfect panel which is a historian and a literature person dealing with literature to kind of literature. So, uh, the question actually is basically both of you are trying to deal with uh, novels which are uh, trying to behind the notion of a true claim, mm -hmm. but at the same time one can see that there is end of the day the falling back into having the truth in place, mm -hmm. if I understand it properly. Mm -hmm. So now uh, my question is, I mean, and again we had when Nicola uh, presented the paper yesterday, we had some photographs which were shown and uh, we didn't know the narrative behind that. What were the narratives which brought the photographs here? Because photographs are frozen in time. So, uh, our evidence can be produced only by the power, or it's always for the power. So, would it be better to kind of have a fictional world rather than trying to fall back into the trap of the truth? Is what I want to get up. I mean, it's a common question, which, which would be probably a more. Okay, uh, I think I'll uh, uh, put from my own uh, disciplinary practice because uh, what I have learned through my own discipline, the discipline of history, is there is uh, nothing absolute in history. Uh, absolutes are alien, they are foreign to the world of history because things are always evolving, they are in making, they are in flux. So, what could have appeared to be true. Uh, 50 years back is no more true, even about the past. A minute before is also not true. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So, my own kind of understanding about that, that I'm against any kind of absolutes, or that is not in the realm of, say, the uh, kind of disciplinary practices, not of only history, but I think other social sciences and like <coughs> literature and other kind of. Uh, um, uh, that could be true of, you see, uh, in the world of theology, as possible, you have, you see, absolute truth, this and that kind of thing, but not in the real uh, world of human beings, you can ever have you see, absolute truth. Uh, I'm just going to be very quick response to that. Well, I think at the end of the day, we all want to make sense of our lives and the world we are living in. So, I, I mean, I, I can see your point, but I agree. I think those narratives are necessary, but without discarding the others. So, um, let me, I know Rashmi is a very, very polemical author in India about, and about everything, but I'm thinking of, you know, this novel Midnight's Children, and what, you know, the, the, the main character, Salim Sinai, says at one point, if you want to know my story, you will have to swallow thousands of stories, millions of stories, and you know, the, there are so many interrelated stories in the novel. So, you see, my point is, truth. What do we understand by truth? My truth, your truth, his truth. But as I said before, at the end of the day, we are living here, you know, um, uh, we want to make sense of our lives, we want to make sense of the world we are living in. So it is not that, you know, we can produce the story, the, the truthful story. That's impossible. That's impossible. I mean, we all, because we all rely on our own memories, our own feelings, our own. Um, um, family, um, um, family, historical, sociological background. But the important thing is to get as many stories as possible, whether in a fictional realm or in a so-called rather more realist realm. But lots and lots of stories, because the truth, what we hear are there. But you know, the more stories we, we know, the more we can realize um, things are are never. Things cannot be that simplistic, and we should systematically criticize, or we should systematically adopt this critical position towards absolutely everything. Yeah, and I think uh, the power equation that you had in mind, uh, uh, what Marx also said, you see that uh, uh, the ruling ideas of any age, of any era, are the ideas of the ruling classes. So I'm going to buy a food. 
the drug yeah, I know, I know exactly what I'm But I'm saying, the, uh, in that sense, uh, what is the truth? I mean, the way um, uh, even Kali uh, uh, objects to that kind of using, the truth that has been uh, projected and served as truth so far is falsehood. He said, no, it is by the ruling classes, the dominant groups and so on. What they have been telling stories about us is not the true stories. They are not the true. We remember through memories and so on what we are constructing now about. Even the remote past, we have the, our own channels of uh, those kind of you know, the links. So even though for 2000 years, uh, the falsehood has been uh, projected as something truth by the so but I, I wonder if, if, if the concern is that, of course, if we think of it in terms of Marxist discourse, that in any kind of a society in which you have two uh, oppositional societies, it's only the vantage point of those who are oppressed that can anyway give us an accurate understanding of society, right? So I understand that that's the vantage point that you're coming from. But I wonder if the, the concern here is a replication of, uh, of a sort of a sanctification of, of truth stories in a sense, by this oppositional, uh, by this uh, opposed faction of, of society, whereby rather than creating something new that would totally destabilize notions of truth overall, we fall back into just a mirror image of constructing artificial truths again and sanctifying them somehow. I don't know if that's your right. question. Yes. We are not uh, talking about the objectivity of the kind uh, that is available to the real uh, on the natural sciences and the scientific world in that sense. Uh, it is, uh, you can't, we can't rule out subjectivity by the way of the human So, objectivity, truth, um, these, these are highly susceptible, uh, uh, suspicious categories. Yes, as long as we rely on, on language, uh, that's it. There is no way out of it. But we need language in order to communicate. But at the same time, we know language is anything that's transparent. I mean, I love you. you know, this may mean so many different things, depending on the person who utters the sentence, depending on the context. So, you see, that's why I said the more stories we get, the better. Because, I mean, we must necessarily write ourselves into existence. But we should be aware of this, you know, of this problem. But, but I think Roshan's question is the kind of stories that we write. Yeah, I know, I know. But is, is, is there a fall back to the evidence that is there or not? <coughs> in the case of autobiography. Again, we fall back into evidence. We try to kind of fictionalize and we try to kind of produce evidence for the fiction that is there. Which, for me, is the problem. Malahar, you had a... Yeah, just to digress a little bit. Um, it's not about uh, uh, novel. I had a long conversation with Kali at uh, Nande, and yeah. he was quite fascinated by the yeah, this is Nande. Yeah. right and, uh, by the idea of writing in Punjabi. Right. And he was quite dismissive of uh, uh, the people uh, who speak English and uh, and theorize and, and talk about theory. Yeah. Uh, uh, he himself was reading, and I understood that he is reading a lot of theory already at that time. How he manages, I don't know, but he said he does struggle with it and uh, read it, try to understand what is going on in the rest of the world about literature and what kind of discussions are happening. So, but the question that I want to ask you is uh, that he was quite proud of writing in Punjab. Yeah. Um, so, you have something to say about that? What, what does it happen? Because what's happening in uh, yesterday we had a conversation, we were thinking about it, like with Chandraban Prasad, I we are all talking about uh, the regional languages in a very uh, dismissive way. Yeah, that, so there is that kind of tension, I think, as far as Chandraban Prasad is coming and uh, Alos Yola is in and worshipping. Worship goddess of English, something like that, uh, especially for Dalits, that if they want to uh, rise, if they want to come out of this Brahmanical oppression and this casteism and so on, so they must switch over to the non-vernaculars. 
so that I mean, that's one kind of position. But I don't think that is uh, kind of tenable at uh, other levels, uh, especially at the creative expressions. I'm saying, uh, for instance, you see those who write in vernacular, uh, they think in, and uh, there is that kind of originality, that rhythm that comes. In. You, you can't have. Uh, control sorry? Con I mean, when he spoke, he said uh, like something like, "This is my world. Yeah, I am in full control of this world, right. this language." Ah. So th that's a kind of uh, thing that he was talking about. Yeah, because. He says that you can, uh, in your own mother tongue and your language, you can get into the uh, finest kind of pores of your thinking body and so on, which no, in no other language, howsoever you have that kind of expertise, even your studies uh, through English medium kind of uh, schools that you can have. So that is his feeling. Not that he doesn't read English. He reads a lot. He reads a lot. And, uh, but then, that is his uh, kind of, uh, I think that is his own sense comes from his own experience. Maybe I mean, it is a uh, spiritual experience in that process of creative thinking and so on. I, I don't really know because I'm not a writer of that kind. But I, I trust him because he, he speaks his heart out. He is not the one who would project something and uh, pretend something to be what he is not. So, uh, when he speaks, uh, he looks like a con man. He is a gunda. <laughs> <laughs> and he is a gabang. Uh, this, this, uh, uh, the next novel, the which is <coughs> press, you can see this uh, It means share with Sanhu, what it means to be a bull, you see, in the city. So it is, he has that kind of. He said, he said in Namdev on the stage. Yeah. <laughs> that I, am like, I look like a gunda. <laughs> No, but he is a very loving character, full of passion, compassion. Okay, thank you so much for this uh, panel. It was another very interesting panel and uh, very pleasant to chair as well. So, thank you so much. And, uh, yeah, sorry. If I'm not any, sure I anymore. No, no, no. If anyone uh, uh, knows how can uh, to uh, uh, read Punjabi, uh, the novel is free to take. Those who cannot, uh, uh, free for you, those who can read. But now. for others, you have to pay. <laughs> <laughs> that is my mother, my love for my mother. <laughs> Art is not quite so fixed, you know, nor is it uh, very certain as to what it may comprise of. So we are really looking at an object of study with whose discipline is not uh, not quite one is not quite certain as to which discipline this uh, category belong does it belong to. Uh, anthropologies, say if we look at the work of Sejika and Nicola here, then there is a case to be made for Dalit literature, to, uh, Dalit art to be a part of uh, the category of anthropology, is it sociology or is it art history? What I'm trying to do in this paper is to actually look at the case for uh, situating Dalit art as an object of study in modern Indian art history and to see what are the uh, problems and possibilities that actually emerge when we try to uh, situate this new category into an already existing discipline. So that is really what my paper is going to be uh, today. Um, I start with an exchange that took place over 10 years ago, almost to the year. And uh, as this exchange, as this was an exchange at, at a seminar <coughs> in uh, Baroda at the Faculty of uh, Fine Arts. And the exchange was between a representative from Sermat, which is 
the uh, organization which looks at the, the relationship between politics and politics and the visual art practice and uh, and uh, and Kachayale. I wouldn't call him a Dalit activist but certainly a person who has been thinking profoundly on the question of caste. Uh, uh, the Samat activist uh, had uh, displayed a whole set of banners around uh, the communalization of education and uh, this was one such banner. The, uh, and what Alaya had to say was that uh, your symbol, even in your critique of Hindutva, <coughs> even in your, the symbols that you use, you are using symbols that uh, really reference an upper caste a Hindu composite, rather than you have no, um, your symbols, your strategies are Ref are addressed to a group which is so deeply upper caste that you are not able to recognize yourself what you are doing. So after a presentation on the work of Sehmat, arguably one of the most consistent groups that has engaged with the political use of the visual, a poster displayed by them on the saffronization of education came to be critiqued. The argument went that the critique of the Hindu right referenced symbolically by the poster, that is the Trishul that you see over here, uh, was blind to the caste provenance of the symbol. This exchange gestured at the possibility of reading the history of art as structured by caste. So it's not that caste suddenly enters into the provenance of uh, visual images or uh, symbols, but it's something which is always there, but it is uh, not read so. In fact, the critique of secularist cultural initiatives that emerge from a framework of caste can be thought to lay out homologies between secularist discourse and right-wing cultural nat nationalism, and this can be seen as putting in question the truth claims of disciplines such as art history. So although art history could be seen as secularist, there was something which was very close to the kind of arguments and uh, sim symbolism used between the Hindu right and uh, the terrain of the secular. It's a commonplace assumption today to uh, affirm that uh, the, there has been a crisis in the social sciences. But perhaps now is a good time to rehearse the fact that this um, uh, crisis came about not because of any sort of implosion of the social sciences or humanities, but it came about from the pressure from the outside, from a whole range of marginalized knowledges, ideas, practices, which challenged the truth claims made by disciplines. So, uh, so this moment where the threshold was seen as something which was easily transacted between secularism and uh, the Hindu right was um, certainly an evidence of how uh, knowledge is not, uh, not uh, acknowledged by disciplines uh, tended, to, uh, tended to force disciplines to change. Um, the question of caste dynamics, an issue which has largely been marginalized by mainstream art historians, has gained significant weight in recent years, particularly uh, G.M. Tartikoff and uh, Kajri Jain in their writing highlight the idea of visual culture of Dalit and uh, by focusing mainly on the politics of uh, public monuments and print culture. On the other hand, people like uh, Vyat Alone have concentrated on the ex 
execution, exclusionary politics of uh, pedagogy and art writing, as well as by focusing on contemporary Dalit artists who contest mainstream representational convention. But apart from people who are located within art history, there have been a, whole, a set of anthropologists, Nicholas Jaud, one of them, Owen Lynch, another, who have focused attention on the aspects of a visual culture and its resonation in the public sphere. Uh, their works have the advantage of locating the visual dimension of public processions, floats, photographs, and other ephemeral visual presentations <coughs> within a framework drawn, drawn from a uh, logic and politics of caste. While such work does pay close attention to the semiotics of the Dalit public visual presentation, as also setting <coughs> attention to the individual producers of visual images. For example, uh, Nicolas uh, focuses on who are the artisans who put together, who uh, formulated the uh, Ambedkar image. There is a marked focus on the political and social effects of these works, but there is also an almost taken for granted distance between the cat category art and the visual production of Dalits. So there's somewhere a resistance uh, to calling this visual production art. So studies that attempt to engage the question of beauty have tended to take two directions. One, exemplified the, by the work of Gary Tartakov, and two, by the more recent writings of Kadri Jain. Uh, Tartakov's work focuses on the iconography of Ambedkar statues uh, and portraiture, offering readings of statues, photographs, and so on, their historical provenance, and most importantly, importantly their meanings for a Dalit viewing public. For example, the way he reads this image of Ambedkar at the second uh, round table conference, contrasting his clothedness uh, as against that of uh, Gandhi, is one way by which Tartakov works um, and how his arguments work. Um, <coughs> Uh, Tartakov uh, is among the first to propose a Dalit iconography that is substantially addressed to a Dalit viewing public. And if you look at the way he uh, uh, photographs images for uh, mon Dalit monuments, for example, this is Diksha Bhumi, he, uh, the, the Dalit viewing public is uh, embedded in uh, the way the monument is imagined. So the monument isn't uh, extracted from its milieu as it were. Uh, in a similar way, he hunts for Buddhist elements in contemporary architecture, both monumental. Uh, this is uh, the Milan College, Aurangabad, uh, 1950, where you can see the Vihara being built at the college. Uh, and also the Shantivana uh, Vihara of Nagpur. Yeah. So, um, so he looks at this both the intimate uh, local presentations as well as, as focuses on the monumentality of uh, Dalit architecture. Uh, but Kachri J, in a recent paper, and my, I focus on this particular paper of earth, the handbag that exploded, has offered a reading of a public park commissioned by BSP leader Mayavati in Lucknow during the time that she was the chief minister of uh, UP. Locating her reading of the monument in the rise of uh, Dalit politics in India, generally, and in UP more specifically, she makes a case for the monumentality of the architecture and plan. And if you look at this image, the uh, grandness of scale, the semiotics of this photograph, certainly points to an almost Taj Mahal-esque uh, quality. Yeah? Um, <coughs> uh, she argues 
that the solidity of the stone, the expense of bronze, and the extensiveness of scale, as has been the specific semiotics of the, um, these are all different views of the um, uh, path, uh, extensiveness of the scale, um, <coughs> uh, semiotics of the chapels and the handbag of Mayavati herself have been systematically worked out to affirm that sense of Dalit history and political presence. So this is a broad statue of, uh, it's an enormous statue um, of uh, Mayavati herself. Uh, uh, take a look at the chapels. Dalit political presence to the Savarnas plays a central role <coughs> in her argument. Uh, both Tarakov and Jay enter the question of visual imagery and Dalit art via the interests that lie profoundly within an art historical domain. And over there you find there is a significant di distance between the work of Owen Lynch and Nicholas ja uh, Jowl because their work is more situated, she exists, in the context of Indian art history, in a stark contrast to the trajectory taken in the discipline with, re with regard to the refashioning of the canon of high art vis a vis of women's art practices. Uh, the idea of Indian women's art practice comes up almost in tandem with uh, efforts to conceptualize women's writing and very quickly such a uh, I'll be able to do this. very quickly such a uh, such an idea is put into place and even naturalized hmm? so uh, you have a set of artists beginning to work together and reposition themselves as women artists and Hardly five years later, you have all sorts of shows talking about Navnaikas, the tradition of women's artists, the Ma has a volume on uh, lost women artists, and a whole tradition of Indian women artists is imagined almost in a space of five or seven years. But such a thing does not seem to happen vis-a-vis -vis the Dalit, uh, the, the, uh, in relation to Dalit art vis-a-vis -vis of the Dalit movement. So it would be tempting to explore the homologies that obtain between Dalit writing and Dalit art. But it has become difficult to pursue such an idea, indeed even to think about the very idea of Dalit art in the absence of a critical mass of self-conscious practice. In contemporary uh, modern Indian art, only two names can be actually invoked when you think of Dalit artists. One is Savi Savarkar, who practices in Delhi, and one is Chandru, who practices from Chennai. But even they are not really part of the, uh, the most common history of modern Indian art, would be hard pressed to include them in any account of modern Indian art art. Um, uh, attempts to set up art critical readings hmm, um, of even Savarkar and Chandru's work falter when the analytical tools that art history provides cannot make sense of the aesthetic proposed in Dalit artwork. The meaning and value of the artwork is then withdrawn from an engagement with the aesthetic and relocated in the arena of the social. Uh, I, to give an example, uh, Dubey's evaluation of Savarkar claims that uh, uh, Savi's art does much more than interrogate formations of caste and religion in India. Indeed, the critical import of his work derives from its twin disposition towards terms of power and determination of difference. There is no attempt to locate such a reading in the realm of the aesthetic. 
uh, Tarakov analysis of the response, uh, the artwork produced by Chandru and his students to the Ramnathan, uh, Ramnath Puram riots of uh, 1998 concludes, there is today a growing acceptance of Dalit involvement in the mainstream art world. Uh, he writes this in 2003 or 4 that fits them into the wider culture. Lacking in critical, political and social content, as most of this art may be, it is still of real importance that the art of Dalit is entering the venue from which it was formerly banned. So, there's no, uh, there's some art history does not actually provide the tools, the aesthetic tools through which Dalit art can be read. So, Dalit ch challenge to aesthetics is not referenced and the political charge of the Dalit aesthetics receives little attention when the locus of reading remains strongly in the social. The relationship between the aesthetic and the political remains unexplored. The foundational st uh, structures of the discipline unshaken by the Category, uh, by the entry of a category such as Dalit art. If following P.J. Binoit, one argues that Dalit art is seen as a terrain where content and form has to be radically reconstituted through a recourse to politics, one can locate this category as a disciplinary challenge to art history as well as a pu public argument in the context of a discourse on caste. The advantage of such a position would be that it would be able to read the aesthetic as a political challenge. When Saurabh Dubey argued that Savarkar's Manu is a work of art, and here it is, it, of inescapable skill, he says, it is crude, even brute, uh, it crude, even brutal as its technique is, he says, its impact is implacable. Manu is depicted as hate-filled Hateful. It is a work of appreciable form as well as searing content. The reading calls attention to the caste dimensions of the work and side by side there is clearly an attempt to invoke the inescapable skill of this artist but this skill is crude, even brutal. You know, the challenge posed by the work to a historically validated repertoire of images is he drawing from German Expressionism, for example, is uh, how does Expressionism, uh, does Expressionism actually get, get reconstituted through this engagement with caste is something which Dubé does not yet address. Um, if Dalit art is read as setting up caste critiques, uh, of art historical evaluation, one of its consequences have been attempts to recover the trace of caste in the story of Indian art. Uh, one such recuperative maneuver could be found by way of revisiting uh, colonial debates. Uh, the, it's uh, now commonplace to argue that uh, Indian art history was constituted to an engagement with the uh, western colonial uh, 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 critiques of Indian art production and uh, these arguments, Ratkin being a very important uh, uh, person over here, uh, uh, argued that while Indians had timeless craft, the, the idea of an individuated art practice based on authorship was not available. Therefore, Indians were craftspeople, not artists. That was a broad, uh, that's a broad argument that uh, uh, Ruskin and others made. So, Indian art history uh, did several things to res rescue the idea of Indian art. There was a range of strategies, identification and validation of Sanskrit text, hunt for signatures of artists, uh, uh, looking for ancient Indian equivalences for key terms in 
Western aesthetics such as Sadrishya for realism, reconceptual, uh, reconceptualization of representational practice in order to validate the aesthetics of temple culture, Kumar Swami's work, all of that. But basically, what Indian art history did was to say that if Indian art, if these art practices are really craft, then our craft is art. But the, over here one can argue that since craft is firmly tied to the category of caste in the context of India, we can really argue that caste lies at the very beginnings of the idea of an Indian art history. Um, but coming to modern art, you have re-readings possible of uh, iconic figures like Ram Kinkal Bej, his Santal family had been read by S. Santosh as a part of a trajectory of a minoritarian aesthetic. But what I am planning to do is focus uh, uh, myself on a reading of two uh, dry pastel works by uh, B.B. Suresh, Roommates 1 and Roommates 2. These are extreme and I will conclude there so I will be on time. So uh, these two works as you can see were done in uh, 1980 at the very time when caste was becoming an important category of analysis in literature at any rate um, and these two images were really important and they were published also in uh, a definitive book called Contemporary Art in Bermuda and they established uh, B. V. Suresh as uh, an important colorist hmm? and a uh, uh, practitioner in, uh, in the field of figurative artwork. Uh, reproduced in the influential contemporary art in Baroda, these works long stood as evidence of Suresh's skill as a figurative artist and as a colorist. But it was only in 2006 that the caste dimensions of the work drew critical notice. But once that happened, it was a uh, uh, sorry, it was almost impossible to read that painting with a caste perspective before that. B. V. Suresh too, in an interview, delineated the caste dimensions of the work only in the mid uh, 2000 2005. But once a caste framework was in place, it's hard to miss the sacred thread running on across his shoulder, the protagonist's shoulder. Um, uh, but once the caste framework was in place, it became impossible to miss the clear articulation of caste. Prior to the caste reading, the works gathered meaning through other frames, figurative, colour. Uh, at that time, upper caste bodies were the normative bodies. Their contours, colours, stature, positioning were naturalised, self-evident. A person could only understand the normative character, the normative character of this naturalized representation only if he or she didn't quite fit within that norm. But for the viewing and dominant caste world, which uh, but for the viewing world which is called into that norm, the struggle to represent the non-normative may well be <coughs> invisible. And that is why it took 25 years for the caste dimension of a, a, an image like roommate to come to view, even though it was viewed all the time, you know. So in these works, Suresh has systematically used uh, skin color as a trope of caste and organized the pictorial space through a complex network of dark and fair bodies suggesting both the systemic nature of power and the violence that it engendered. In fact, 
it, 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 it <coughs> feels as if that today she's weaving a web of caste. In roommates too, for example, no one is looking at this figure who sits so dark and grave, indeed completely visible in the center of the composition. He may be at the center of the canvas, but in the interplay of gazes, he does not figure except tangentially. I think I'll stop here. Thank and uh, yeah. Thank you, Deepa, for speaking. Uh, so we have around uh, 10 minutes for discussion. So I don't want to intervene between. I'll just make a small quick point, probably, which is on uh, I mean, Savi's one incident that happened in JNU. What happened is 2009, we all tried to put up some posters for UDSF in JNU. So Savi Savakar himself came and viewed the posters and uh, with along with Emerson Pandian and Santosh Sadanandan and so on and so forth. And uh, what happened is it completely shocked the campus in terms of aesthetics because one is familiar with Savi's work. So he has drawn the other money that he has got plus various other things. So on that note, I Thanks. Um, yes, so I take the opportunity to respond to your, your critique. I really welcome, anyways, uh, your, the way you challenge uh, my and other people's words. And I think maybe you have. Uh, I just want to add an information regarding this article that you have read, uh, my article on the Ambedkar statues. Um, I think you've read it in the context of the book uh, uh, edited by. Uh, Gary Tartakov, mm -hmm. which whose title is I think Dalit Art. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I just want to uh, remind, yeah. yeah. So I just want to remind that uh, my article was originally published in Contributions to Indian Sociology, and was reprinted in that huh. article. And he just added a few photographs that I had uh, taken, but uh, the, the text is, uh, is uh, totally the, the same, it's been republished as it was. And my article initially was not at all a reflection on Dalit art. I, uh, uh, my article uh, was an article about the uses of statue uh, of statues uh, in the Ambedkarite uh, uh, movement, especially by the by the BSP. How these uh, statues have helped Dalit villagers to uh, Dalit activists to mobilize villagers around an object, uh, around the idea of conquering public space in a village. Of uh, bringing this object, and uh, and uh, I my reflection is more on the uh, materiality of the object, what it enables people to do, what kind of agency it has, rather than uh, on Dalit art. I don't even think I even yeah. use that uh, expression. Yeah. Um, so um, maybe you've read that article in the context of this book, which makes you think that uh, I actually uh, uh, talked about Dalit art, which is not really the case uh, initially. And also, I would like to challenge a little bit uh, uh, your uh, notion of Dalit art as applied to these uh, statues or to this kind of art, um, because I see, a, I see, really see a qualitative difference between what uh, Savi Savarkar, for instance, does, because he's in the circuit of art, he's in the market of art, he uh, shows his work in galleries, etc., etc. He sells his his, uh, his uh, paintings as art, whereas these Ambedkar statues or uh, this uh, imagery, even the posters, etc. I, I challenge, in fact, the fact that it, it can even be called Dalit art. I mean, these statues, uh, I've met these sculptors, and I really approve your idea that one should also do a study of uh, uh, authorship and uh, who are these artists, uh, where do they, they get their you know, uh, aesthetic influence, do they have, actually have uh, uh, their own aesthetics that they are also developing, which is uh, probably the case, but which is totally unknown. Um, but these sculptures are not Dalits, they are actually tribals, um, they are Shilpkars in UP, they are Shilpkars, so they are a small tribal community from Eastern UP who do this statue. They are not all part of the Dalit movement, they have not been uh, mobilized at all into this anti caste uh, movement. And the owners of these shops are Banyas. And so they, <coughs> and, and these Banyas and these sculptures actually kind of negotiate together what can be done. They're also inspired. There's a lot of imitation going on. and At the same time, innovation, uh, aesthetic details that are being added by the artists, etc. But uh, 
the fact that they are consumed by Dalit activists. It's Dalit activists who order the statues, buy them, and display them in the villages. Uh, doesn't uh, make it Dalit art, you know. And these these statues are also not only made for a Dalit public. They are also put up on public spaces for the, for the rest of the public to see. So uh, I think that there is a risk of essentialization of Dalit art on, uh, in these several uh, uh, accounts. Yeah, actually, I think what I was arguing is that there's a distinction between your work and Gary Tatekov's work yes. in the sense that your work is located anthropologically in the sense that you are looking at visual phenomena. I don't call it Dalita. Okay. I say it's visual phenomena, yeah. ephemeral quite often. And this visual phenomena is seen in the context of a politics and an anthropology. And I'm saying that, uh, so this is one way in which Dalits and the visual is being put together. And what I was trying to do in this paper was trying to look at how can one pull together these two categories, the idea of the visual and the idea of caste. So actually my paper is not really about Dalit art. I'm saying that it's a category in the making. We don't even know what it is, you know. So, um, so I'm saying that there is a big difference between the kind of work you're doing and the kind of work Tatakov is doing. And, and maybe I wasn't very clear in what I said, but this was the distinction that I made. And, uh, the, uh, and I used it to lead into the question of what happens in the discipline of art history. You know, and uh, how, why is art history so uncomfortable with the question of caste. And if caste has entered with as a possible tool of aesthetics, not poly, uh, not uh, yeah, aesthetics, then why is there such a discomfort around this? So, and what is the provenance of that discomfort? I think that was what I was trying to do. Um, about what can be named Dalit art, that is again a question for the future. But at the current moment, I think there is a great deal of uh, uh, work to, uh, there's a lot of critical energy which is going to undermine the idea of a high art which is displayed in galleries and other kinds of public visual performance. The very idea of installation and public art is uh, art moves which uh, seek to problematize notions of high art. You know, so, uh, uh, and uh, the example that Joshi gave, for example, about uh, uh, Savi Savarkar's poster making. Uh, so, then, the constant attempt to kind of uh, uh, renegotiate what is art in the first place. And when such a renegotiation is taking place, then the entry of a category like Dalit will uh, has a certain stake. The, the, the idea of a Dalit art will have a stake in this renegotiation. And uh, we would need studies to figure, th figure it out. I mean, I'm, uh, I hope I'm not essentializing the question of Dalita. I'm saying that there are problems. And I'm saying it's not already there. It is our framework which will make it. Yeah. I, wanna, I mean, maybe I, I'd like to take up the question from the other end, as it were, which is, um, you know, I, I think it's 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 very interesting the the, the, the kind of um, impasse that you've opened up, right? And I think that's kind of you know the, the, the project in a sense. And hearing you respond actually to to uh, to Nico as well, um, that if we were then to actually engage your project on the ground of aesthetics, which I think is what you're asking us to do, um, then the argument is also that art history. Um, fetishizes 
the even the materiality of the object in a particular way, right? And so it is actually about inframing, and it's the modes of inframing that art history practices that disallow something like this, which is deeply embedded in politics, the politics of the statue and of space, even more than even the, the politics of the statue, right? That this is a claim on public space, which is to say we are here, right? And, and this is about the mass, the, yes. um, the mass object as a well. So if one were to move to the, to the aesthetic question that you've asked, and I think it's very, very interesting um, that you're posing it at that level. I, want to kind of ask you then what the implications would be. I mean, beyond suggesting that we already have a history of caste embedded in the way that Indian art history writes its own genealogy, because at the heart of that was a distinction between art and craft. If Indian art were to come down on the side of craft, which let me call it manual labor, then caste is already part of that history of manual labor, and therefore it exists. OK. But it still doesn't get me, it seems to me, to the question of aesthetic. And so I'm thinking about somebody like, you know, Sharad Patil, who writes, has written for a long time about this idea of uh, Brahmani um, aesthetics and so forth. So I, I want to kind of actually push you a little bit more on what are the implications for the aesthetic in mm -hmm. thinking about a Dalit art mm -hmm. practice? Because I'm not sure that you've moved, in a sense, you've moved as far along there. Yeah. You've given us a, you know, you've set up a possible space for a critique. But I don't know what would be implied in that, and I think it's very, very interesting. Because what is involved there is a new practice of seeing. Yeah. Um, um, actually, I, um, yeah. So, what I suggest is that if one uses car a critique of caste as a framework, then one can revisit the entire trajectory of uh, modern Indian art and produce a caste art history. I'm saying that is one possibility. And uh, the example I give is this. Yeah? I, I can also talk about uh, one of the Kerala ra radicals, I think Madhu. He does, in 1980, at this very moment, he makes, uh, he paints a uh, picture, called, uh, he does a painting called um, Harijan Bhumi. Harijan Bhumi. Uh, Side by side, uh, uh, K.P. Soman does a whole set of installations around the brew. You know, so we uh, so one move is to look like what happened with the women's movement. We hunted for images, did we not? We looked for images which uh, spoke to us, and perhaps the same hunt needs to be undertaken vis-a-vis -vis of looking at art <coughs> cast. That is one possibility. But I was also trying to suggest, and I stopped the paper where, uh, according to time, but um, one of the uh, things that I wanted to talk about was the questions that I I would be grappling with when I think about the relationship of the aesthetic with caste and for, uh, would be, so how does one understand caste visually? You know, it's not exactly the same as understanding caste through a story or a poem. So how do you represent it visually? How can you set up visual modes of address? How do you address who is your viewing public? How do you address a caste constituency? If you want to set up vision, like uh, uh, Nicolas, for example, said that here are these statues. They claim a space and they speak to who we are as a people, as a community. Right? I mean, if I got you right. So, the question of address, how, who does, who is the fixed spectator of this artwork, if I may put it in a different way, or how does one structure representation so that one can address the non-normative caste context, given gallery spaces, 
given the established institutional spaces available for high art, given the way the public spaces are organized. So in which case, how does one, how does caste actually manifest itself? What are the representation <coughs> strategies that might be used? And how does one engage caste and community through drawing a figure, a landscape, or an object? It is that simple. What exactly is <coughs> the language, the visual <coughs> language, through which you can uh, uh, portray caste? You know? So, uh, yeah. I'm sorry, unfortunately, yeah. it's a rich paper with a lot of possibilities of discussion, but due to lack of time in the next present the meeting, we have to continue the discussion probably on coffee later. Thank you, Deepta, for this wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you.